Fantasy folks, welcome to Fabric of Folklore. I am your hostess, Vanessa Y. Rogers, and this is the podcast where we unravel the mysteries of folklore. This is a podcast, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of our history, of our stories, of our traditions. This is a podcast for inquisitive people who love knowing more about their own culture and that of others as well. Through exploring our folklore and the fabric and threads that bind us together, we discover that we as humans have held so dear for generations that we have continued in the, in the traditions as they've been passed on in, uh, in our story, in our craft, in our mythology, in our celebrations, and more. For instance, there is a mythology prevalent in many Native American tribes, including Navajo, Karrison, and Hopi of a spider woman. In many cases, she is associated with the creation of life and helps humans by teaching survival skills. Spider woman also teaches the Navajos the art of weaving and many weavers before sitting down at the loom, rub their hands and spider web to absorb the wisdom and the skills of spider woman. So this sounds like a podcast that you are interested in and listening to, make sure you hit that subscribe button today, whether you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on a podcast platform like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you're listening, hit that subscribe button so that you get our notifications every Tuesday when our new podcast airs. Today's show is slightly different than usual. Most episodes on Fabric of Folklore are about discovering the origins and the roots of folklore. But I came upon this organization that is practicing a folk craft in such a beautiful way, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to learn and share more about it. Today's episode is decidedly not about history of the craft, but about a new way it's being practiced today. Our guests are the founders of Loose Ends Project. Loose Ends project aims to ease grief, create community, and inspire generosity by matching volunteer handwork finishers with projects people have left unfinished due to death or disability. Jen Simonic and Macy Kaplan are the founders of this organization and our guests today on Fabric of Folklore. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us here today. Yeah, this is, this is great. Thank you. Um, so can so let's start with Jen. Can you tell us about your journey into creating loose ends? How did this uh, come about? Um, Macy and I have been friends for about thirty years, and we've always been interested in fiber arts. I knit um, and crochet a little, and Macy knits crochet. She's done. Well, she can tell you, but I think she's done pretty much every craft. Um, <laughs> and it's something that when we get to get a chance to get together, we. We'll go look at a yarn store or go and um, do projects um, together. But recently we had a friend pass away whose mom, uh, not our, our friend's mom passed away and her mom had left behind two giant crocheted blankets to be finished for her two brothers. And she had expressed some worry that it wasn't gonna be done by the time she passed away. and. Um, and we were going through the bag because, you know, when when a crafter dies, people usually try to find some place for that bag of stuff that mom or, you know, grandma left behind. So we were going through it and we found these blankets. And um, and then Macy said, uh, I think I've been thinking about this thing for a while. And Macy, I'll let you finish the story. <laughs> OK, um, so, yeah, so for a I want to say a few years um, I'd been talking and mentioning it to Jen from lo a long time ago, but I've been thinking about the idea of how do we, so we had both finished projects for people whose loved ones had died and it felt really good to do that. I mean, it just is a really, it gives you something to do for your friend who's grieving. Um mm -hmm. And it also gives your your the person your um, who owns the project a tangible um, object that their loved one had been touching, had been making for them special, um, and it kind of com the feeling that I got um, completing that was just really good, and. Mm. 
So I'd been thinking, how do we, is there a way where we could get strangers to do this for each other and as a way of connecting people? Um, and so Jen and I were um, helping our friend go through her mom's bag of stuff. And having found these blankets, we thought, you know, we were sort of hatching this plan for a couple of years and, and just waiting for the right time to do it. And it just, all of the synapses connected and we thought, I think now might be the time. We have two potential projects to get started with and um, and why not, you know? I mean, it, why wait? You know, life's short. <laughs> and if we wanted to try this out, it just seemed like good timing and we did. Took a whirl. So you just put together a website and put it out there and people yeah. started signing up? Yeah. So we started, so I created a website. Um, we, we didn't have any funding or anything like that. So we did it all, um, as you know, economically as we could, we used, um, Google forms and Google spreadsheets to, to give people a tool, um, with which to sign up, um, and submit projects and sign up as volunteers. And at first that was plenty, like it was enough. It was manageable. Um, because we were just starting and there weren't a whole lot of projects yet and there weren't a lot of finishers yet. And then just in the first couple of months, we had maybe 150 finishers signed up from, from all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a handful of projects, maybe five projects and many of that, the, and two of those were our friends. Um, and so it was just, it was fine. It was like a tiny little, almost like a little pilot to work on those first couple of projects and see if there was any interest and see how it would go. Jen and I, um, I designed some flyers and Jen and I just passed them out locally in Seattle and Portland, Maine, um, emailed them here and there throughout the country to places we knew might be interested. Uh, we joined some social media groups of crafters and tried to get the word out there. And just in that little grassroots way, we had you know, in the first month or so we had maybe between one and 200 volunteers signed up, which we couldn't we be more thrilled. Like that was so yeah. exciting to think that someone else thought that this was a, a cool concept and yeah. uh, interested in giving their time to, I mean, we, we felt like it was worth our time, but the fact that other people started to feel like they were interested too, was really, really exciting to us. Um, and so that's sort of the roots of how we started to get the word out. And then once we started getting a, a little bit of press and the and um, more people started finding out about Lucen's project that way, um, mm -hmm. more and more people started to sign up and yeah. more projects started to come in. And, um, and now we are just after... I mean, last week was our one year birthday and we have almost 17,000 volunteer finishers and probably close to 2000 projects. Yeah. In 60 countries. So some yeah. of the countries we've got one or two people, uh, there's one woman in Qatar and uh, there are people in, in far flung countries where, where we only have that one person, but they're very, you know, they've, they've reached out and said, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. We've got two in Singapore, um, mostly in English speaking, speaking countries, we have most of our projects. So we've got like, uh, the United States has the bulk cause that's where we started, but Canada, there's, there's a ton of projects and finishers. There are finishers in Australia, New Zealand, uh, England, we've got tons of projects. Um, and these are projects ranging from, you know, uh, a hand knit meerkat, which was our first project in the, in the UK to, uh, looms that have people have rented box trucks to move the entire loom to go to where it needs to go to, you know, Afghans to quilts. It's, it's been pretty, mm. it's been pretty amazing. Um, not surprising. Honestly, I'm not surprised that, that crafters are giving all their time. Um, and, and, and I know to speak to the theme of your show, this is something people have been doing forever. We didn't, 
we didn't make up the idea of finishing somebody else's stuff. They, this is something that people do. Um, the twist that we put on it is normally that would be done in your quilting bee that you have every week at church or your, mm-hmm. you know, or the, the, the synagogue's knitting circle or, you know, the, these places that we don't, that not, not everybody's part of right now. Um, mm-hmm. So the idea of crafters picking up stuff that's been left behind is, it's not a new one. What's new is the fact that we can find that crafter and connect it with a, a stranger so that they have that benefit of having a crafter in their life, which not everybody has, you know. Do you have a sense of the age of most of your volunteers? Hmm. They run the gamut. I had a 13 year old sign up yesterday. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. They're, I mean, I would say more people than not are in there between the twenties and seventies range, yeah. mm-hmm. but we also have people kind of kids, kids who've wanted to do it. Um, teens, yeah. lots of teens who've wanted to do it. We obviously, we don't share any of their information publicly because it's you mm-hmm. know private, but, um, 80 year old. Yeah. We, I have an 80 year old who's like, I can't do the knitting anymore, but if you need me to stomp stamp envelopes, I'm in like just, you know, there are people want to help and they've been really uh, just generous with their time and their talent. It's, it's, that's the phenomenal part. It's not surprising. It's just overwhelming how, how lovely, you know, how, mm-hmm. just how caring people can be to a perfect stranger. So I, I am really heartened by that because I feel like a lot of folk crafts um, are kind of dying out. How you were talking about in the past, a lot of this would have been done by family members. Um, if a, a project went unfinished, you know, other crafters in the in the family would have taken it on and finished it themselves. But a lot of that craft is being lost. Um, I know from, from my own family, we, I came from a family of quilters. And so that was a really big thing in our family. And I sat in on several quilting projects, but I myself am not, uh, I, I would not know how to do a quilt on my own. Um, and so I, I feel like that's more of a, a craft that a lot of older people have knowledge of, but not a lot of younger people do. Is that the sense that you're getting, um, and I'll, I'll direct this to Macy, or is this, um, are you seeing more interest in young people today and the craft is coming back? Yeah, I, I am, I mean, I mean, Jen may have something to say about this too, but I, I am seeing so much interest from younger people. Um, lots of quilters, I mean, and, um, lots of knitters. And I think that knitting enjoyed a little bit of a revolution like 10, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, and, um, then again, um, during the pandemic, so many people being home and, um, isolated and bored and needing something to do that felt productive and that kept them busy. And that maybe was beautiful and joyful, learned how to do a craft. A lot of people tell us that when they sign up, that they learned, they, especially the people who are newer at it will say, I mean, because we ask people, what is their skill level? And um, when folk, a lot of the folks who say they're beginners picked it up during the pandemic um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe ordered some stuff that came to the house. They learned on YouTube, which isn't always the greatest way to learn a handcraft, Mm -hmm. but they figured it out. Um, and I know that before the pandemic, I think there were 65 million knitters in the United States alone. So I don't think it's just older folks. I mean, no. I, it is the whole range and we're seeing that we're definitely seeing that, um, with our finisher population. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to agree. We, it is not one demographic. Like I thought we were going to see one demographic and I'm sure everybody thought that, but you know, Mm-mm. we see people from all over the place. We have a lot of people who came to us through Reddit because they were on a Reddit where they did Amagori, which is, you know, making little tiny animals out of, out of crochet. We've got, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, the, 
the one thing that I can say is the bulk, not all, but the bulk are women. Um, okay. We've got some fabulous, talented male crafters, uh, people who identify as male. We've, they, we've got crafters who are definitely male, but 90% are probably women. And I, and I, as that a feminist, what? That we, not, that yeah. we can tell because we, you know, we, we ask them to tell us their name, but they don't have to tell us anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and their bios can be really voluminous or just, you know, a couple of phrases. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes we get a hint because they'll say things like, I'm a beginner knitting a knitter. I've only been knitting for 52 years. And you're like, <laughs> really? but, but, you know, you can do something for 50 years and not be an expert. It's, yeah. it's okay. But there's, we, the projects run the gamut from being very technical to not being technical. So it, we can always take that, that level of skill or craft, but yeah, there it's not, it's not a bunch of gray haired ladies sitting around on rocking chairs. It, I mean, I'm I mean, it, so, <laughs> but, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's the gamut. We've got so many different <clears throat> talented people that that just want to share their, share their love of their craft. And, mm -hmm. and we don't care. We don't care who's <laughs> right. Like, no. everybody. Have, yeah, everybody. We have people Everyone's who are like, welcome. yeah, Jesus sent me. We're like, great. Bye. <laughs> awesome. You know, Instagram. We don't, care. <laughs> we don't care. We don't care. We just, just <laughs> as long as you're, you're willing to, if you're willing to pick up your craft and do it for someone for free and just to, to ease their grief that, that shows a level of empathy that, that we need, you know, not, a, mm -hmm. it's not, um, it, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that older, young people stepping up or want to help somebody. So that's a, that's a win. Yeah. So let's take a step back just a minute. And I want to talk about how y'all learned your craft. Awesome. So, um, Macy, why don't you could start? I Could I hit pause for one second on that? Sure. I have to run really, really quick, and I'll be right back. Okay. Then I'll start with Jen. <laughs> why don't you <laughs> tell me about your, um, so how you I, learned your craft? I learned to knit um, from my grandmother, who taught me on stainless steel needles that were really small that she used to knit bandages during World War II. Um, I... Uh, have had undiagnosed ADHD through my life. Um, and when I was in sixth grade, I got into a lot of trouble because I was always the kid who had my hand up. I was the annoying girl in the front with all the answers, um, <laughs> which it was not as loved as you'd think. Um, so I did knit in middle school to, before we had spit, fidget spinners and things like that, I, mm -hmm. I knit um, to calm my, calm myself um, it, through my life, it has been accepted or not accepted as something to do in a meeting. People have mm -hmm. strong opinions. They don't think that I'm paying attention if I'm knitting, but honestly, mm -hmm. if you want me to pay attention, you let me do something with my hands or I'm going to be annoying. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's how I learned. I, I learned to crochet through, through books when I was younger as well, but. Mm, okay. And then Macy, I, I hear you, uh, are a crafter of many things. Well, so I learned first how to crochet when I was a really, really little. And I just remember my dad bringing me to this, to a woman's house. He was friends with her kid, her grown child. I mean, he was my father, so he was, they were older. But, um, and I remember her, her name was Mrs. Euricchio. And I remember just sitting on the couch watching when they would visit with each other and just watching her hands go like lightning fast and just being enthralled by that. And I just remember going over one day and she taught me how to do it. And I was, you know, making crochet, beginning crochet isn't hard. Crochet can get very complicated really, really complicated, but to learn how to do a chain stitch, like a kid can learn that. So that was how I first learned to crochet. And then I, my mom taught me how to knit when I was a teenager. Um, I 
I sort of didn't keep up with it. And then I relearned again in my 20s and then I haven't stopped since. And then the other handcrafts that I've learned, weaving, um, I learned in college, spinning. I took a class here in Portland, mm -hmm. Maine um, to learn how to spin maybe 15 years ago. And then I got a wheel and um, that's it. I've never done any of the embroidery kind of stuff or cross stitch or needlepoint. Those are things we see come through a lot that we find mm -hmm. finishers for, but I've never done that before. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Yeah, I learned I learned cross stitching as a, a, a child. I think that's a typical one for for kids to learn because it has like very easy patterns, and I I think it can get more complicated. But I, it's I really did good. a lot of cross stitch as a ten year old. My aunt did it, and she she taught me how to do cross stitch, but. I think for me, the the end result, I was kind of like, mm, like there's only so much wall mm -hmm. space. I wanted to have <laughs> something to wear at the end, but I did a lot. Um, but hey, I yeah. mean, pot holders might have been, may have been yeah. the universal first craft for a lot of people. Yeah. Right? Yes. Remember those really pot holders? Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely. I did. I did that in school. I remember coming home with pot holders from in school. Oh yeah. Um. So, what are some of the more unusual crafts you see coming through? Oh yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. We, we, Jen and I have learned a lot this year about stuff, and I just learned a new one yesterday. Um, what Brazilian needlepoint? Brazilian, Brazilian needlepoint. What? Yeah. What's, what makes something Brazilian? I don't know. <laughs> I I, I actually. Had them. A couple of months ago, we got something that looked like it was a, it looked like it was a, a knitted blanket. And the person's like, no, my mom was a crocheter. And I was like, but that looks like a big knitting needle. And there's this thing called Tunisian crochet, which has a long needle and you, you have all these live stitches, but you're really just crocheting across. Um, I got a second one from that same book that's out of date that we found Macy yesterday. And instead of being a Dallas Cowboys one, it is a Giants one. So I, cool. we, because we, we already went through the process of knowing that this is Tunisian crochet. I now know to ask for someone who can do Tunisian crochet. Well, you also had like broomstick knit. Oh, broomstick, broomstick lace, which yeah. is uh, it's crochet, but you've got these giant loops that get created through, um, having it wrapped around a broomstick. Some people use a really thick, like number 50 knitting needle just because it's smooth, uh -huh. but people can use broomsticks. We also had um, hairpin lace, which people, everybody has seen one of these looms in their life. They just didn't know what it was for. Um, it's like an arch thing. It's usually there's tinny metal that, that you see at um, estate sales, like, uh, like you know needles like this but it's mm -hmm. a loop and then it's got like a it's got like a plastic thing in between and you you basically weave it between these between these this loop so that hairpin lace nail binding did we nail get a project binding. yeah uh yeah one um nail binding which is like vikings did i think yeah <laughs> um, and they're, they're the uh the nordic museum just had a class in it I'm so really? sad that I missed it. Like, I think I should have gone. I'm curious <laughs> because the people make mittens with this and it will, they look so cool. And it's like a, a pointy, um, it's its own tool. It's like a metal, um, like pointy on one end with a hole in the other end. And it's, I think you basically move it like it's so, and I, I, I don't call it, I should not talk about this. Um, <laughs> it, it, the way you do it makes it look knitted, but it or knotted knots. They're like knots, but interesting. Um, it's nail bind n a l b i n d i n g. It's oh, cool. Yeah, that, I mean, that, and that kind of makes sense because it's from the Nordic tradition, where those you know a lot of fishermen, a lot of people weaving uh, probably nets and things like that. So you're trying to get something a little bit more dense that you can take out into the rain. Mm -hmm. And are these crafts that are more unusual, are they harder to find finishers or do you put a, a call out and 
someone says, hey, I know how to do that. Yeah. So I would say they're more unusual, but we always can find finishers because there are so many talented people who've signed up to do this. We can't, we, well, we usually try to match people who live nearby one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when, when a, a more unusual craft project comes up, we do often have to have it shipped. They, p- the people mm-hmm. will ship it to each other. But so far, um, knock on wood, so far every, the people have stepped up and said, I, I mean, there's 17, almost 17,000 crafters. And most of them do multiple things. Like yeah. it's rare mm-hmm. that you'll say, someone will say, oh, I just sew. I just knit. There's yeah. usually like a laundry list of things and um, yeah, sometimes the we, weird stuff in there. Yeah. And we try to make it so that they're doing something they find interesting. Um, I had a, mm-hmm. I had a candle wicked um, bedspread, which is basically just, it, it's kind of like knotting. Like you make these tiny little knots that are decorative on top of something. It's usually a white palette with these little knots all over it. Um, mm. And I had just recently had somebody do that. There's cruel work. There's needlepoint on a on a a, a printed pattern on a a um, canvas. There's I mean just there's a lot of different things. And when we match people, we we tend the first thing we go for is location because shipping's expensive. Mm-hmm. You know greenhouse house gas you know you just want to reduce the environmental impact Mm -hmm. um you don't want to do bad while doing good and then we do find out whether or not the person has a skill and then you know when they signed up factors into it if they've been waiting for a project for a year we want to give them a project um Mm -hmm. but those types of things we end up doing a, a search and finding like five people might might have mentioned them the other thing we have is our finishers um we have a couple places where they congregate we have a facebook page just for them and mm-hmm. when we do run into those we ones that were you know those underrepresented crafts we'll go mm-hmm. on to our our finisher group and say hey does anyone know what this is and <laughs> within 20 minutes somebody will have identified it Within a, within a day, somebody will step up and say, I teach a class at a local university on yeah. that, and I'd love to help you. I mean, it's, it's the internet. They're amazing. As helpful as the internet is, this is what it's made for. Oh, People are just awesome. Or they'll go and find me five YouTube videos on it, or they'll, they're, they're just amazing. Everyone raises their hand in there, in that group. Yeah. It's this little secret, a secret. There's like 8,000 <laughs> people in there. Um, it's a private Facebook group just for finishers. And that's where Jen and I go. I mean, and they can all talk about the stuff they're working on. They can ask each other for help with things. It's this beautiful community. Um, And they can kind of show off their stuff that they're doing. Mm -hmm. But also Jen and I do use that as a, as a help, you know, it's just like, what is this pattern? What is this? Help. Help, Help, please. This was without a pattern. Like we'll just show a part of a thing and just say, we don't know what to do with this. Like, what is this called? And it's just, people are awesome. You know, they're just. I have this one crochet genius who you know, early days, he had to do some knit mittens. And that was like outside of his comfort, but he did them. But mostly like, I would go on my favorite story is I went on and was like, has anyone seen this? It was a crocheted tablecloth. And I was like, has anyone ever done anything like this? He got on and was like, that is from this magazine from 1935. I've got a copy of it in my closet, but I'll just write it up for you. I've done it. So he wrote it up and was like, here's the pattern. This is what I see is going on there. He was right. Like there are, I, I just can't say enough the amount of talent that these people have. And, Mm -hmm. but I don't want to scare anybody away because, you know, on top, like we have these very talented people who are finishing Christmas traditions of everybody has a stocking from grandma and we want to make sure everybody continues to have one. And can someone just make one more? So this generate the one kid who didn't get one can get one. And then we've got things like styrofoam snowmen that 
grandma really wanted everybody to have. Mm -hmm. So some lovely person knit little little scarves for these sty and put together these styrofoam snowmen. And we got back a picture of an entire family, like three generations all holding their snowmen. Yeah. So, you know, it's a range. It's a range. What, what do you think it is about people who go into crafting crafters? What do you think makes them feel more generous than, I don't know. I, I feel like it's, it's a quality particular to to people who do craft is that is that a sense that you get Macy I don't, I don't I do find that crafters are generous that is true um almost across the board I mean obviously not everybody maybe someone only makes things for themselves maybe <laughs> but but I will say that is true however I also find that people who love to cook or people who do woodworking also like giving, like it's, I, I feel like it isn't just, um, handwork crafters. We're finding like, it's, I feel like handwork is a medium to express that generosity and love as is mm -hmm. food, as is woodworking, as is, um, as is computer, stuff. computer skills. My yes. next door neighbor is building us a web app so we don't have to stare at a spreadsheet anymore. Yeah. Like it's been hours of time. Um, we have, we have a, a generous group of like, as soon as we talked about how we were matching, which was through a spreadsheet. And as you can imagine, if you've worked with a number of cells on a, on a spreadsheet, 17,000 cells is a lot of cells and it, it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't really go very well. Um, and we have a group of, we have got a, a group of people who've, who've contacted us and said, Hey, how can I help organize? How can I help? Uh, how can I, I use Tableau. Could that help you with what we're doing? I use, um, I'm really good at all kinds, all kinds of things. So you have a young man who's out of Texas, who was like, I think I've done some mapping before. If you want to use, use my skills. And he's been volunteering yeah. uh, weekly to help us get stuff done. We also have, you know, friends who, we have our friend who signed up 11th as our 11th finisher. She's, she was, was, took a step back and was like, oh, these people are much better at this than I am, but I'll help you with your spreadsheet. And she's become invaluable. She's our, on our board now. Yeah. So people are just, you know, I think people are looking for something good to do. They're looking for something they can get behind. It's been rough the last couple of years. We're so divisive. Mm -hmm. And this is just something that everybody can relate to. Everyone's going to lose somebody. Everyone's going to die. And it it gives them a place to, you know, just work, like work for somebody else for a little bit and, and do something that they can feel good about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think everybody's depressed uh, about the state of the world mm -hmm. and the quickest way to feel better is to connect to other people and to do something for somebody else, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like balm for your for your sad self, and <laughs> it's we've made it. I feel like Lucen's project is a is a platform where people can find that kind of connection. Um, people who are handwork crafters now, um, and like Jen said, we we were on a someone did a story about us that had a lot of um, exposure. And it was all throughout the next couple of weeks. We were getting te um, emails saying you two should not be using spreadsheets. Strangers. Oh, uh, the, I, I said, <laughs> yeah, I said something flippant. Like we're looking at spread spreadsheets till our eyes bleed. Yeah. And like 30 <laughs> people were like, we can fix that. Don't, don't. <laughs> that. Yeah. But now we have a little team of people who are helping. So Jen's um, friend and neighbor, who is an amazing um developer has made us this platform, but we have a little team of people to help him now. And yeah. it's just been like, yeah, they don't do crafts. And they we could always crafts. use more if any, if there's any designer, yeah. Yeah. uh, tech people, project managers, I'd love to hear you. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, it's just one of those, it's amazing. Like people hear what we're doing. And one, one thing we get is there are some people who are like, people do this. 
And we're like, yeah, they do. <laughs> they totally do. It's like always been a thing. We're not saying we don't. We didn't make sure. We're saying is like we're trying to facilitate it. So mm -hmm. th there are some stories that have happened uh, where people are like, and then Jen and Macy sit and knit for hours to fix all these projects. I don't. I don't. I don't I, they're, we can't because there's don't too do many of them. Yeah, there's too many people who want to do projects. There have been times where I'm like, oh, I want to do that one. And then I'm like, I can't. There's all, there's all these other people waiting. Uh-huh. <laughs> so talk but, to me a little bit about the community building that you're doing. I, you spoke to the, the Facebook group that is happening. Um, is there community building anywhere else, like where people are meeting and um, doing crafts together or anything like that? We have found um, that that there have been a handful of people, at least that I know about, um, finishers who have met the project owner and then throughout the process of finishing the project for them have also taught them how to do it. So there have been lessons happening, crafting lessons yeah. between the person who with the project doesn't know the, the craft, but mm -hmm. maybe curious about how it's done or interested. and. Um, and there, then the yeah, there have been, together on it. I just recently had someone uh, who said, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm in your area and I'd love to finish your mom's project, or I could teach you how to. And the lady was like, You teach me how to finish my mom's project? And the lady's like, Sure. So they meet once a week and they are working on the project together. Yeah. Um, we people we have a lot say, of that. Yeah. People who say, Come by, I'm going to make you lunch. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of friendships getting built just one on one at a time, you know, um, in terms of large amounts of connections, in terms of groups, we aren't, um, we're not really facilitating large groups of people getting together to do this stuff at this time. Um, there's potential for that kind of thing in the future, but right now it's two of us yeah. <laughs> and, our, and, our, and our generous friends helping and, um, um, yeah, and I, I think, I mean, we're not really sitting on a horde of projects. Um, the projects come in one at a time. I have, we have had knitting groups reach out to us and say, just give us, give us five projects. I'm like, we have to wait for the five projects in your area. Um, that being said, we did just talk to a group uh, in, in England that their whole mission is to get people out of isolation by matching older people with younger people. Um, and they have coffee or tea and they were like, how, how can we, how can we do something together? And I was like, well, I mean, the fact we, we've done programming for people where we, you know, talk to librarians and talk to a group of people to explain what we do talk about. So those are, those are opportunities that we've had. Um, mm -hmm. and those, those community building things are, are just, um, we've just kind of given a little push in, in that we've made the opportunity, but people people are really finding a lot of community in this. We've had people say, you know what? We found out we went to the same small college in Michigan and we even lived in the same house a couple years. Be <laughs> like it's, there's been a lot of those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that everybody's finding somebody that's very different from themselves, but what they are mm -hmm. finding is someone in their community that they had not known was there before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the crafts that um, you are facilitating and those that are currently not um, eligible yet. So if you've got a fiber art, we're all over it. We, we can help with a fiber art. Um, quilting okay. comes with its own set of things because quilting has, it's not just making a quilt top. It's, it's putting it all together, basing, and there's, there's a lot there. Um, so that's a little bit different, but we've done sewing projects. We've done mending projects, anything with a fiber, we're all over. We did have a project come in that were ceramic dogs. I tried to match them because some five people in our 17,000 plus groups and I do ceramics and I was like, but um, I have not heard back from them. So I don't think, I think that it was a bridge too far. We've had woodworkers reach out to us who are really excited to help, but we haven't figured mm -hmm. out how to facilitate that. 
I've asked, yeah. I've actually matched a couple, I, I've introduced a couple of woodworkers, but they haven't worked out yet. But I would say um, the projects that we do not, um, that do not qualify are projects that are just something that someone tried out and they don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, we do have a lot of people who are like, I started this, but eh into it yet yeah. or no. projects that people um that were left behind by a loved one but they don't want it back yeah no. um, we don't match those either i mean they're they're mm -hmm. special we we completely understand why they wouldn't want to just donate them away because a lot of time and love and sometimes expense has gone into making that partial project but that's something that we usually have to decline or or refer mm -hmm. out to to a different place to donate it with where they will you know they will finish it up and maybe mm -hmm. yeah I, because because these finishers are expecting to come and have that kind of heart connection yeah. if, if for lack of a better word they want to they want to do this because they feel like they're helping somebody and giving them a tangible item that they're going to remember and you know take care of so mm -hmm. to say, yeah, and then you could just keep it is yes. like, no, they have other things they can keep. They have things that they want to do that are their own that they chose. <laughs> they were right. trying to help you. So it, and <laughs> yeah, so it, I, I do the, the first couple of times we talked about it, we had people who were like, oh, I've got a lot of things. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> no, that's not what we do. So. Where do you see the organization growing? What crafts do you see coming in in the future? Or what do you, where do you see your expanse? Well, a lot of the um, finishers who have signed up have offered other skills too. They, there have been a lot of people saying, I also do woodworking or I'll finish someone's song or I'll finish someone's painting or poems. Um, we don't match folks that way yet but mm -hmm. there is um there is i mean we can envision a, a place where any kind of creative work might be able if someone wants it not all creative mm -hmm. works are meant to be finished um mm -hmm. but there is there could be a future where any type of creative work could be finished um mm -hmm. And there could we could grow that kind of network and th and that's a dream for someday maybe mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that anything else. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, those types of things, the more people that sign up as finishers, the more we have opportunities to connect different types mm -hmm. of things. Um, the, I think this, the, the really fun part in the last year is that we do have people almost everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, when people come to us and say, you probably don't have anybody in this area. We're like, actually, we've got five. Let me see if they, if anybody can help you. Um, yeah. That's been just truly amazing. And that just speaks mm -hmm. to the, just how people want to share their skills and their arts and their, and what they can do and, and the good feeling that they get from doing it. Um, do you have any particular favorite stories? Well, I've got a lot of stories, Macy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean... We just recently had a, a beautiful sweater finished in Hawaii for a family or for a, a knitting group in Maui. Um, and they, and when we, I did I do like monthly check-ins. How's everybody doing? Is everybody, you know, are you on the track? And as I was doing it, I remembered this person's in Maui and it was right during the fires. And, um, you know, we were like the, the other person was in, I think on the big island and, you know, just the, like, are, are you okay? Is everything okay? And, you know, reaching out to people. So a lot of people going through loss that are doing these projects for other people because it, it made them feel good. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stories about like, Hey, my mom, when my mom died, I didn't have anyone to finish this project for me. So I learned how to do this. And, because I feel that that's important, I'm going to help you with your project. Um, mm -hmm. Specific stories, you know, they run the gamut from, you know, a, a spouse that died days earlier and, you know, was working on something that they found at the bedside table 
And we were able to match that project uh, to, you know, I, I say this a lot, but there's this one family who said grandma made an ugly blanket for everyone and Bob doesn't have an ugly blanket. <laughs> <laughs> that was grandma must have known that her blankets were ugly that's all i can hope um it was pretty ugly but it was it was something that that the family wanted and, and it, it it you know completed the whole like bob now has that it's it's his, his thing so i there's just I mean, there's a lot of family tradition getting yeah. <laughs> brought full circle. Jen matched a project by that a man um, submitted his young his younger sister had started mm -hmm. before she died, and um, and he wanted this little piece of her crochet to become a larger piece, like a blanket or something, and so. Um, matching and he himself had i mean we're talking about um an ex-military man learned how to crochet by joining crochet groups for his sister i mean it and that's beautiful you know you don't it's a little bit outside of who you think of as the crochet demographic but here's this beautiful thing right and he was learning how to crochet himself to honor his sister's work and to make something. And then um, one of the groups he was in referred him our way. And so now he's working with a crochet finisher together to make something out of his sister's work. So I think that's a really beautiful story. Yeah. And, and, and that comes with, you know, there, when we first got the piece, we were like, that's not a blanket. That's a coaster. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we're, we looked we looked at it and you know said hey what's what in and there was more to the story and um and dealing with a lot of grief and you know the when a 21 year old leaves our leaves leaves the earth unintentionally it's it's scary and terrible and you and then the amount of outpouring on our finisher group, which was like, Hey, I, I think you could do this. And people designing Afghans and saying, I think we could do this, or we could do this. And these are the, what kind of colors does he want? Um, yeah, just a lot, there, just a lot of care and consideration. Right. Yeah. Yeah. People asking really thoughtful questions about her and what kind of stuff she liked and what she would have wanted. And I mean, and just, yeah, it's really hard to, to just, pick i mean they're just mm. stories are beautiful and um and i would say that maybe the ones that make us cry the most are the ones that are from younger people who've passed away and or mm. or or, or adults who are like this or just yeah just really have this strong like i i shouldn't say that i'm gonna say off the record for that but um it it does seem to be a i mean a lot of grief around um losses that happen from suicide or from unexpected accidents or um we've had gun violence we've had acts we've had moms who've been hit by cars i mean like there are just some really stories that are just have jen and i in tears yeah um, just recently had a baby blanket that was started by a mom who passed away from cancer the second wife who has more children with with the dad um found the blanket and we're finishing it for the child of the you know the stepchild who is turning 25 and is going to have a kid so like yeah <laughs> that was like oh <laughs> um, yeah. it gets you in the in the heartstrings <laughs> you not cry when you hear about these things they're just so so lovely and the fact that the kid who's doing that one and i'm i'm calling him a kid he's probably in his 30s but <laughs> like it's I, the work that he normally does is kind of edgy and just different and fun. And this is a very traditional quilt and he is up to the, or he's just like, and this is what it looks like. And he, I get weekly emails cause we're 
we're if we're lucky we're we're uh, looped in on the emails and i'm getting weekly pictures of now that the letters are done it's going to take a little bit longer because i got to put the little uh, animals next to and i'm like picturing like this 20 year old dude who's you know, just you know like making a baby quilt which is just so cute. i know i love it <laughs> <It's horrible. laughs> and just That's lovely beautiful. right somebody raised that mm -hmm. kid right <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> um, so what do you feel like you have learned in this journey about yourself and about other people? Hmm. Uh, what is, what is something that surprised you? I, uh, so I don't think I'm surprised that strangers can be wonderful to each other. I am, I am the person who gets the life story out of the cab driver when dropped off. So like, I am not surprised that there are people out there. There is a community of people waiting to, to help you. Um, hmm. what I am surprised at is, um, I'm just surprised at the, uh, the amount of empathy that's out there in terms of how people know how to act with these things for the most part people people know how to do grief better than i do i think they know how to they know how to help with grief better than i do they, they're just they're it's it's a main just a the the it's it's not just the talent that people have it's just the empathy that they show that's just overwhelming um i i knew it was out there i just don't it's so nice to see daily Mm -hmm. I I would say that um, I can't remember if I already said this, but it is the biggest surprise to me. And um, and like Jen said, I wasn't really surprised, but I was like, oh wow, yeah. Just I guess it reinforced that um, it didn't really matter what anyone's religion or skin color or socioeconomic background or education or location or anything had to do with it. It was people rising to the occasion to offer comfort to another person and to give their skills regardless of whether or not they would believe they would be on the same page about politics or any other, anything like, um, now all of that stuff, we don't have a, a purse, a type of person in our finisher group. It's everybody's in there, um, from every background and it doesn't, none of that stuff matters. And we don't even know what it is unless someone happens to mention like a detail about themselves. Yeah. We don't, we don't not care, but we don't, pay attention to the details about that when we're matching people at all. And so the people who are turn, becoming um, partners in this project um, may not have liked each other if they had met under these circumstances. They may not have given each other the benefit of the doubt or chance or anything. They might have met under not great circumstances. And um, I think that the the biggest sort of cool surprise in all of this to me is just how so many thousands and thousands of people are connecting with each other without regard um, to any of that stuff, except just this 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 human experience of um, empathy and wanting to comfort each other in grief or through craft. Um, yeah. And like I, Ben said, um, um, it, and um, people on both sides. So if you look at the two parts of a project, the finisher and the project owner, mm -hmm. one half of that relationship knows a craft. Both parts of that relationship understand what it's like to lose a loved one because that isn't that doesn't care who you are. That happens to everybody. So that's where they're meeting. So that that's, I think, I, I think it's funny. We, we recently added pronouns in because people were telling us that they wanted 
certain pronouns and we didn't have a, a space for it. So we put in a, a non-mandatory pronoun thing. And the first two we got, the first one said their pronouns were they, and the second one said their pronouns were Mrs. We were like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's kind of speak to the kind of people, like there's, it's yeah. all kinds of people. Yeah. And, um, and they're, they're all welcome. Then they can, you know, and they, they're all bringing their gift and they're, they can meet somebody new. And hopefully, even though it's, you know, we tend to isolate geographically with different politics, it doesn't mean that everybody's the same and we're finding this common ground, which is kind of amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. So for people who want to help, where can they go and, um, who are you needing? We need anybody who can do a fiber art to sign up. Um, we, we have, you know, it's on our website. They can go to www.loseendsproject.org um, and they can sign up as a finisher. Um, we always need projects. So if you've got a project, we'd love to help you with it. Um, that's, that's another thing, place that they can, they can do it. Um, and just because we have 17,000 finishers doesn't mean we have all the finishers we need in every area. So Macy, yeah. any? Yeah. Um, one way that people could help us find more projects is by going to looseendsproject.org. And, um, there's a whole page called flyers and, downloading our flyer and sharing it locally. Like you can either email it or print it old fashioned style and share it that way. But the more places that understand that we exist, the more projects will come in out of people's closets, you know, and into the hands of finishers who are waiting for them. Yeah. And if uh, we can also use people who have skills in, in translation. So if there's a language that somebody feels that they need a flyer in, we're, we're open to having people help us with that. Uh, we also, um, do need technical people to help us with our web, our web app. If people are interested in helping us, um, if you're, if you have a skill that we haven't mentioned, let us know, sign up, let us know. <laughs> so is there anything that we haven't covered that we we've missed that is important that we, we talk about, you think? I think we, we covered it. Um, <laughs> we are, we are self-funded right now. We, we are, we're not, we're, we are a nonprofit. So if you want to donate to what we are doing, mm -hmm. um, it's tax deductible because we are a IRS approved nonprofit. Um, we are looking for sponsors. Uh, we are looking for, a way to make this sustainable. Macy and I are both working on this full time without pay right now. Um, so donations are, are welcome. And, um, that's about, that's about it. You know, if you want to help us, we'd love to have you. It takes an army. It does. <laughs> an army of knitters. Not, yeah. Right. <laughs> knitters and organized people and, mm -hmm. you know, all those good things, Instagrammers and, podcasters and reporters. Uh, anytime yeah. we get to talk to on a podcast, uh, um, we do see people signing up, which is lovely. And anytime we have a news article, we can see like, oh, you know, the Thunder Thunder Bay in in Ontario wrote an article and we can see the the results of that. So yeah. kind of, yeah. it's fun. If a floods of people after following every bit of press. So it's really, really great. Yeah. Um, people can also follow us on social media and if they like stuff, share it. We always like that. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we'll definitely put all your links up on, on our website, which is www.fabricoffolklore.com so people can find you. Um, and thank you so much y'all for, for joining us today. This was such a, a lovely episode. Yeah. Thank you for the invite. Yeah. Super fun to talk to somebody about this. It's, uh, and, you know, if it wasn't for folk art, we probably wouldn't have this, this project to do. So That's true. Oh, Alana, I love that you're, you're doing this, this beautiful, kind project and, and 
you know, encouraging this these folk crafts that, you know, there have been some crafts that are lost, but I, I think organizations like yours um, really spur and encourage people to continue in these in these uh, these folk crafts. So I think it's wonderful. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank really you. appreciate you. And thank you, folksy folks, for joining us today. Do you have a folk craft that you like? Do you like cross stitching, knitting? Um, if you do, make sure you you sign up to volunteer at the Loose Ends Project. And once again, I'll put up all their their links on our website. And if you enjoyed today's show, there are lots of ways you can show your appreciation for the work we're doing here. You can share the show with your best friend or a stranger. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you hit that thumbs up. And no matter where you're listening or watching, make sure you subscribe so you get the notifications every Tuesday when our podcast airs. Um, and one of the absolute best things that you can help us with is write us a review and give us stars if, you watch, if you're listening on Apple a podcast because that really helps other people to find our show. Thanks again for unraveling the mysteries of folklore. I'm your hostess, Vanessa Y. Rogers, and until next time, keep the folk alive. <laughs>